In today's video, we're discussing the future of Pierre-Luc Dubois and whether signing his qualifying offer will delay him getting to Montreal. We're also going to discuss rumors of a rejected trade between the Jets and the Hams. Plus, we're going to take a look at the future of the Toronto Maple Leafs. We are expecting another cost-cutting trade to take place. We're also looking to the Calgary Flames. They made a blockbuster deal for Matthew Kachuk in the wee hours of last night. But are the players that were acquired, will they sign and stay? Or could they be making other moves here, maybe flipping them to other teams? All that and more coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a lot to talk about here today. Uh, first up, we do have some signings to discuss, and I do want to talk a little bit further about the Matthew Kachuk trade and the potential spin-off from that. Now, the signings we're going to talk about here today, nothing too substantial, nothing like we saw yesterday, but the Calgary Flames have signed young forward Matthew Phillips. He gets a one-year, two-way deal at $750,000. Uh, he had filed for arbitration, so that will no longer be required. Um, I do find it a little funny how he filed for arbitration, and this is the deal he ended up with. Uh, why they couldn't have come to terms on that sooner, I'm not sure. But either way, Phillips has been a pretty good young prospect developing in their minor league system. Given the current cap situation in Calgary and the current, I guess you could say, lack of experience forward signed for the NHL roster, I would think we're going to see one or two youngsters make the leap into the Flames roster this year. And Phillips, I think, stands a great chance to be one of those players. Uh, speaking of young players looking to find a full-time spot in the NHL, that takes us to our next signing here where the Boston Bruins have signed Jack Stanika. Once looked upon as being the future top six center, probably a number two center, likely a replacement for David Krejci. Of course, right now we don't know 100% the future of Bergeron and Krejci, so it's hard to say where Stanika will fit for the coming year, but he gets a two-year contract extension. The cap hits 762000 uh, the first year of the deal is a two-way contract, whereas the second year is a one-way deal. So within the next year, he will definitely be um, on the roster, at least providing that they feel like they can keep him. Of course, they could always put him on waivers or possibly trade him, but I guess there's still lots of questions to be answered in Boston before he really knows a better uh, idea what his role is going to be this year. Uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets have signed Trey fix Volansky. He gets a one-year extension, a two-way deal, 750 as well. A couple of uh, young forwards in the LA Kings organization sign extensions as well. Uh, Gabe Velarde gets a one-year, one-way deal, 825. And uh, Jared Anderson Dolan gets a one-year, but he gets a two-way deal, 750 to NHL level, 100K at the AHL level. I'm a little surprised that Anderson Dolan didn't get a one-way myself. Um, I know he didn't play a ton last year, but he really had a real solid American Hockey League season. I'm a little bit surprised he's kind of fallen lower on the depth chart here. Gabe Velarde was a player many expected the Kings to part with this offseason, and that has not happened. So we'll see if he remains there. But obviously this is a decent contract if another team is going to make a trade and take a chance on him here uh, for sure. Now, next up, I want to talk a little bit about the blockbuster deal that we saw in the wee hours of the morning. Of course, where I live on the East Coast in Canada, I'm on Atlantic time. Uh, so I believe the trade went down around 1.30 or something like that, 1, 1.30 in the morning. Of course, I was already sleeping for the night. Uh, I just happened to wake up around 3 or something after 3 o'clock and just something told me to check my phone. Had some messages there. People let me know about this deal. And, of course, looked at Twitter and was like, holy jumping. So, of course, I... Popped out of bed to get a video posted to the channel as soon as I could. Uh, I couldn't wait to talk about the, the video or get back to sleep after seeing the, the magnitude of that trade. It might be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, trade in the cap era. Like You don't see 100-point players change teams very often, especially during the offseason after having such a solid year, let alone have two of them be traded for each other. It's almost unheard of. So... Certainly, a blockbuster is, is to put it lightly. Before getting any further, though, I do want to give a quick shout out to a friend of the channel, uh, Eric, who calls himself Flying Fluffy on YouTube. I'll link his channel down below in the pinned comment. His channel dedicated to Florida Panthers news and updates and game reviews and all that kind of stuff. Does a really good job breaking things down. Uh, he goes by Jawsaholic on Twitter. I'll link that as well in case you want to uh, follow him on that platform. But he actually predicted this trade about two to three days ago pretty much to a T. Like he, uh, in a video, uh, talked about maybe letting Huberdo and Uyghur and maybe a first-round pick go for Matthew Kajak. Like he pretty much 
you know, predicted this exactly the way it ended up going down, which is crazy. You know, we talk about trade rumors. Uh, sometimes we make predictions, and it's it's hard to get it exact, uh, let alone really close. But uh, like he just called it. I mean, being a Panther fan, obviously knows that team well. And obviously, like, you know, Jonathan Huberdeau, a very productive player there a long time. One of the, you know, fran- young franchises, really all-time great players. And, uh, you know, obviously you could sign him to an eight-year extension when he's about to turn 30. Or you could get Matthew Kachuk on an eight-year contract, you know, at five years younger than that, right? So it certainly it does have some value there. But obviously at the same time, we can dissect the trade in its entirety a little bit further at another time, looking at who wins this deal. And I do have a, a comment and I do have a post here on the community channel looking for feedback on who wins this trade because it's not really clear, right? Uh, but a couple of rumors that came with this trade is that the New Jersey Devils and the Carolina Hurricanes were also very much in the mix right up until late here when the deal was consummated between the Flames and the Panthers. So we know that there was other teams in the mix. Uh, there was a, a group of five teams that were listed here by, I believe it was uh, Jeremy Rutherford of The Athletic, uh, Eric Francis who covers the Flames for Sportsnet, kind of disputed that that list wasn't completely accurate. That original list was, of course, uh, the the, the, Saint, the the hometown St. Louis Blues, Vegas, Dallas, uh, Florida, and Nashville. And it was believed that the Devils and Rangers had sought, uh, you know, before had talked to the Flames about seeing if there was any way they'd move them. But, of course, uh, you know, that never materialized, and I think he would have accepted a trade there too. The Rangers were pretty much impossible to do because of their cap situation. The Devils were probably the closest of course, the GM there, Tom Fitzgerald, is even uh, you know a cousin to the Kachuk family, so somebody that knows Matthew extremely well. Um, but when Florida offered up the deal that they did, Calgary and Brad Tree Living had no choice but to accept here. Of course, most of the other teams were rumored to be offering more of a future-based um, you know package, which just makes sense from the Devils' perspectives. They wouldn't have had a player of you know experience level of like a Huberdeau uh, who puts up that kind of offense to offer in a deal. All the players that they would have considered moving would have been either young, barely established, or you know not established at all, or first-round picks, or things of that nature, right? So makes sense that Calgary can make this deal still remain competitive here in the short term. Uh, but certainly another thing that we learned much later after I made the video for that trade, as well as the breakdown of the contract structure, we do know that, of course, as it was eight years, nine and a half million per season. Of course, the state of Florida, much more favorable tax situation than Alberta or many other uh, jurisdictions around the NHL. So certainly he's going to get to keep more of that money there than he would at most other places. Um, and he also is getting the bulk of it paid in signing bonuses. Every year of the contract, he gets one million in salary and eight and a half in signing bonus, which I believe is actually pretty much the same structure as Barkov got in Florida as well. I believe he's paid a million salary on his new deal, and the rest is all signing bonus here as well. So those are a few little details that we learned after the fact, but there's already talk, already rumors, speculation about what are the Flames going to do? Are they done, or are they going to continue wheeling and dealing here? Obviously, Jonathan Huberdeau is a tremendous player, a very offensively gifted player, and to me would be the, the, one of the most comparable players you could get to replace Johnny Gaudreau. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, Huberdeau's numbers long-term might even be a little better. I'd have to look at the, the history books here to kind of compare. But obviously, a similar kind of player. Guys who rack up tons of assists, playmakers, pass-first guy. You know, certainly somebody who can give you the almost identical style of play, except he does have more size, a little bit different. But still, a lot of the same qualities. Like, if you're looking around the NHL saying... Who's a star player that we might be able to trade for that would give us a very similar style and all that? He is the guy. Like That makes a ton of sense. But will he sign an extension? I've already seen reports that teams are calling Calgary, already gonna getting a line in case this doesn't work out. Now, of course, it's really early. I don't want Flames fans to be uh, upset or to be frustrated because we don't know, right? We, we really don't know. and We don't have a reason to believe right now that Huberto won't stay. So I don't want to get people thinking that we're saying he's leaving or the trend's going to continue or any of that stuff. Obviously, Jonathan Huberto is Canadian, so I don't think he has a problem playing in Canada. Um, But you know what? The word is, though, is that he was having extension talks with the Florida Panthers. It was believed that this was one of those what many people considered a slam dunk extension that we were going to see just about any time. It was reported that he had, like they had enough talks that he was kind of just waiting for an offer to come in. Like the next phone call was going to be, 
here's what we're willing to offer not your trade it have a nice day like that's not what he was expecting so people are saying he was completely blindsided and it's just kind of in shock right now right so you know will he re-up in calgary long term i don't know but teams are already kind of inquiring according to dave peck note of the fourth theory.com he was already reporting i believe it was on nhl network and sirius xm earlier today talking about the fact that that teams are already checking this out so We'll see. I mean, same goes for Mackenzie Weger. Now, you look at the Calgary Flames blue line. They suddenly have a really crowded blue line. Weger is really good, so I'm not suggesting that he's definitely going to get moved. But look at their group now, their top four. Uh, obviously, they've got, uh, you know, Noah Hannafin. you got Rasmus Anderson. They just re-signed Nikita Zadorov. Oliver Shillington played at the top four level. you got Chris Tanev, who is going to be likely out to start the season for the first bit. But he's there, and now you've got Uyghur. That's a heck of a top six. You know, then you've got a guy like Valamaki, then a few other youngsters can kind of round out your decor. But it's a lot of money tied up in the blue line for starters. Uyghur is, to me, good enough on amongst any of that group to be in the top pair. Um, not paid like it compared to some of them right now. But are they going to want to extend him to be able to pay him maybe, say, $6 million bucks a year? Uh, where he's making like three and a quarter now. Like, that's a big raise for him. Cap-wise, it's going to be challenging. Um, and do they really want that? I could see a scenario where either Uyghur or another defenseman is flipped. If you look at their breakdown of their roster and who signed as well through capfriendly.com, they only have like, I think, nine forwards under contract right now. Uh, you get Andrew Mangiapane, who's a pending RFA. Uh, he... Uh, of course, would make number 10 when that deal gets done and he's going through arbitration or at least possibly going through arbitration. It's going to get done. We know it's not going to be too long. So that gives them 10 forwards, right? So they're going to be comfortable filling in with, like, say, Matthew Phillips and either Peltier or Zary or one of those young prospects. Are they going to step up in camp and grab a spot and they'll have a few more youngsters in the lineup? Or is Daryl Sutter going to want a little bit more um, experience because they don't really have much of, like, a third line, so to speak. They have a, a pretty good top six now bringing in Huberdeau. Uh, maybe not quite as good as before because they've lost two really good pieces there. But it's decent, especially if Dylan Dubé could step up, for example. But they don't have a lot of players for that, you know, that fourth line. Like They have their third and fourth line. They're going to be not the greatest and have a lot of inexperience right now. So I wouldn't be shocked if Calgary wanted to add a forward or two that have a little bit more experience. So makes a lot of sense they could consider moving a defenseman for that kind of return so i wouldn't be shocked here if they go down that road and i know a lot of people are already pointing huberto to montreal because obviously he's a quebec born player i believe he grew up not far from the montreal area or rated around montreal so like you know certainly i don't know that he would be opposed to i believe he's actually been hanging out in quebec visiting family here as of late if i'm not mistaken so um you know obviously that's a little early to say that but there's already a lot of talk on social media about him wanting to maybe go to Montreal. I was like, well, you know what? There's been a lot of talk about some Quebec-born players wanting to go there, including Pierre-Luc Dubois, who we're going to talk about here in a minute. So it will be interesting to see what happens, but I don't know. This this whole trade is a massive return for Calgary. Brad Tree Living did a masterful job, but can he sign those players and keep them? Now, I understand, though, that it's not a, a terrible deal, even if they don't want to sign because he can then trade them for good returns. Like, you imagine if Jonathan Huberdeau is uh, one of the top players available at the trade deadline this year. But if Calgary's in a playoff position, that's going to make them not want to do it, but they can't let another player go out the door. It's just it's really hard to say, and it's early to say how this is all going to play out. The rumors are already flying. I know it's very premature, but we have to wait and see if Calgary can get these players signed, or will it continue to change and evolve here with this team in the next... Uh, leading weeks leading into training camp. Now, speaking of Pierre-Luc Dubois, uh, will his signing of a qualifying offer prevent a trade or stop a trade from happening sooner than later? Of course, he's got a one-year deal, $6 million bucks that will set up his qualifying offer next year, uh, you know, being the same amount. So, you know, will he, at that point, maybe make more sense to be traded then? Maybe that's what some seem to think. I know there's a report from Montreal Hockey Now suggesting that they feel like a trade is less likely now that he signed. That basically, if they would have traded him, they would have traded him. He could have signed a long-term extension with Montreal, um, you know, right off the get-go here and be committed to them, uh, you know, on either a sign-in trade for eight years or seven years or whatever. But now that he signed a qualifying offer, maybe it's more likely that he gets moved next year instead. We know Kevin Chevelday off 
is extremely patient. Look what he's done with Jacob Truba. Uh, you know, even back when he had to handle the Evander Kane trade out of Winnipeg. Like, every time he's had a trade scenario, same thing goes for Patrick Line. Like, he does not rush. He takes his time. He gets it right. Or at least he feels like, waits till he feels like he gets it right. He doesn't feel that pressure. So, ultimately, wouldn't be surprising if a Dubois trade is delayed. Now, it is believed that Ken Hughes and the Habs almost certainly engaged with the Jets on trade talk around Pierre-Luc Dubois, but it's believed the ask in return was either one of Nick Suzuki or Cole Caulfield absolutely had to be involved in the deal, and the Habs rejected that, and things never really went any further. So I believe was that they were having some trade talks at the 2022 NHL draft. Uh, the rumors have it that Dubois himself was in attendance of that draft and that they were led to believe that there was a deal being discussed and they thought it might actually work out. I even see Montreal media, who I think were getting some uh, rumors, you know, kind of behind the scenes, suggesting that a deal was likely coming. They never really went into detail what it was. But now that we know this, it's many think that that's what it was that some of these media members were alluding to, but it never came to be. Suddenly we saw Montreal kind of flip a switch here and, be, and make the deal with Chicago for Kirby Doc, kind of instead trading Alexander Roman up to the Islanders. They get the first rounder, then they flip that for Doc, right? So, essentially, they kind of change gears. So, we'll see what happens about Pierre-Luc Dubois and um, the Montreal Canadiens right now. It, it could technically happen, but we have reason to believe that it's more than likely, as of today at least, going to wait and, and be something that they'll likely see more later. Unless Montreal wants to pony up one of those other top players, which we know they don't want to do, then it doesn't make sense for them to pull the trigger because that's what the Winnipeg Jets absolutely want unless the situation and the circumstance changes so that they're you know have a reason to take something else that's going to be what they want now the other the team i want to talk about here quickly well as well as the toronto maple leafs uh we i want to reference a couple articles from james myrtle of the athletic talking about a cost-cutting trade you're likely to see the leafs here in the coming days or weeks it's hard to say when this is going to be and a lot of it really boils down to the contract of rasmus sandin now of course this could drag on for some time uh we already seen his qualifying offer Expire. So this could drag on uh, for some time here before he actually gets a deal done. I know it's rumored that he's looking for more money than Timothy Lilgren. Well, I've seen some people argue that they should get about the same deal, but it's believed he's looking for more of a contract in that two to three million range on a couple years uh, term. Then looking for the least but kind of a you know some good faith in what he's able and capable to do moving forward. But there is also a major log jam on the blue line, and I also think it's fair to say that he's waiting for them to do something to kind of have a more defined role for him because he's been kind of passed over numerous times throughout the playoffs in the last couple of years between the playoffs and regular season. He kind of keeps getting bumped. They keep making other additions or changes so that he's the guy that's the odd man out. We saw it again with Giordano uh, being acquired. Of course, Sandine that caused him to, to really not get a role in the playoffs. And, of course, Giordano's back again. Now, keep in mind as well that Sandine's agent is Louis Gross. Uh, Louis Gross is not afraid to have his people wait and play hardball. He's also the agent for William Nylander. Of course, you all remember that saga a few years ago where Nylander almost didn't get signed in time to be able to play for the rest of the year. They just barely made the deadline by a, a fraction. I think it was under an hour that they had to get that contract signed and registered with the league so that he wasn't forced to sit out the rest of the season. So I don't think we're going to see Sandine give in here. Uh, I think we're either going to see Sandine trade it or another move made to create some cap space and a role for him. James Myrtle has kind of suggested the more likely scenario he sees unfolding is an Alex Kerfoot trade to create the necessary space, especially after seeing the acquisition of Cali Yarncroke. And that does make sense. I wouldn't completely rule that out. But you already had a logjam on the blue line where you have Riley, you have Muzzin, uh, you know, you have Giordano, you have Brody, who normally plays his opposite side. You have Justin Hall, who, you know, makes sense to move him if he can. Then, you, of course, you have Lilgren. And then you brought in Victor Mete and Jordy Ben as well. Where does Rasmus Sandin fit in all of this? And I really don't know, like I said, that we're going to see a signing. I wouldn't be shocked if they, they're they kind of, you know, forced here. If they really want to keep Sandin to move a defenseman. But according to Myrtle, he doesn't see that happening. I mean, he's pretty well connected with the Leafs. He doesn't think they're going to trade Muzzin. Uh, I don't see them trading Giordano after just signing him or Morgan Riley. Uh, Brody plays his offside. You get Lilligren on his offside. They have a loaded left side with lots of uh, experience there. And they have a weaker right side. Sandine's obviously not, doesn't seem to be at least really crazy about playing his offside either. You don't want too many D doing that on the same team. 
Uh, and it's just kind of a, a log jam there. I was kind of really confused when they brought in Ben and Mete. So we'll have to see what happens. But the Leafs definitely have work to do 100%. Just a matter of what they decide to do. Are they going to move a defenseman? Is it going to be Kerfoot? Could it be both? Or could Sandin kind of force a trade here if he doesn't get himself a role that he likes and kind of just maybe play hardball and sit out until there's a spot waiting for him or it's ready? The other option he could do as well is he could seek an offer sheet and kind of force the Leafs' hand to either for, to, uh, to match it and get his deal done or to be moved to a team where he can have a more defined role. Because that's one thing now where he didn't accept his qualifying offer, there's no arbitration, he very well could be a prime candidate for an offer sheet and you're not going to pay huge money for him even if you go into like the you'd have to overpay a bit like into that say maybe a four million range but if a team wants to do that just for one year uh on a one-year deal force the Leafs to kind of take a cheap compensation and then extend them on a better deal after like that's like you saw with Kaka Niemi that's something I wouldn't completely rule out here if there is a prime offer sheet target across the NHL right now it's him. So let me know your thoughts on everything discussed here today down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis on all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.